listening to the Jewel City Podcast. You can join us in person Sundays at 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. We have something for all people and all ages. Or join our live stream at 10 a.m. In this podcast, we're going to hear a message from our congressional care pastor, Aaron Caton. Tonight's message titled, It's Personal. It's personal. Look at your neighbor and say it's personal. Personal. It's nothing personal between me and you. It's just personal. Amen? All right. If you would, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. We're going to be in Luke chapter 9, verse 24, verse 23. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. And he said to them all, he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Pastor Rita, will you bless the reading? Heavenly Father, once again, we're found in your house. Father, as I was worshiping tonight, the thought went through my mind. If I want to go to the courthouse or the airport or customs or the White House, it's a big deal. We can't get in without this and that. But I can stroll into your presence Mm. 24-7 anytime I choose to do so because of the name of Jesus Christ and the benefit package that I have. Father, I pray tonight that we've already felt your presence in this place. There is none above you. There, Father, is no equal. There is no rival. We can go no mm. higher than you. Thank you. So we come to the King of Kings and we see you as Isaiah did, high and lifted up yes. on your throne where yes. there is nothing impossible with you. I pray that this evening that, Father, the anointing will be yes. all yes. over my Pastor Aaron. I pray, Father, that you would honor every moment that he has spent in preparation and that each word, each verse would be saturated with the anointing and the power of God. And as he breaks the bread of life, let us not sit idly by and watch others partake, but let us grab a big hunk and tear into the bread of life and let us stuff our pockets full, Father, and take it home and chew on it all week. I pray that you would honor this man, that you would bless him, Father, and that your presence would be just turned loose in this place tonight. You. Have your way, and we will give you the honor and you the glory. Yes, for God. no one else deserves it. You can yes. do what nobody else can do. You, Father, Lord. this is your night. These are your people. This is your house. This yes. is your show. Yes, yes. And Father, we just bow to you. It's Bless all you, yours Bless in you, Jesus' Lord. name. Amen. Amen. Give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. It's personal. Verse 24, for whosoever will save his life. She'll lose it. And as I was coming over, the Lord started speaking to me, and and I I started thinking, whoever wants to save his life, that means God has brought you out of of life. Jesus is saying that he's brought you out already, but if you want to try to save your life, meaning Jesus is saying if you want to go back to what you used to be, that that you're going to lose your eternal promise, you're going to lose your, your guarantee of heaven, hell will become your home. He's saying if you want to save what you used to be, if you want to be that adulterous man, go back to it, but you want to lose your home in heaven. If you want to be that alcoholic, you go back to it, but you're going to lose that spot. Do you want to lose that spot? Huh? He says, whosoever, whosoever is, a, is who believes in Jesus in John 3 and 16, the whosoever will lose his life for my sake the same, shall he save it. When we think about when he met Peter in a boat, he said, follow me and be fishers of men. And Peter left everything behind. He said, I, I'm willing to go wherever you want me to go. I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. I'm willing and Peter saved his life by losing it for Jesus' sake. As a whosoever that believes in Jesus, we are saved. The preaching and teaching from the gospel for whosoever, it's personal. It's personal. It doesn't say a we soever or an us soever. It says a whosoever. It's good to be a we soever. It's good to be in the body of Christ, in the body of believers that believe like mindedness. It's good because iron sharpens iron, but this is personal. Jesus says, whoever. Whosoever that desires to save his life, his or her life, that is singular, will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life, again, that's singular. Jesus says, for my sake, my, which is singular, will find it. 
It's personal. When you lose your keys, it's good to find it. When you lose your glasses, which is usually on top of your head or on your eyes, it's good to find it. Amen. When, when you lose your cell phone, nowadays you just tap a button and it tells you exactly where your phone is and you find it. When the Holy Spirit drew you out of darkness and you were lost in sin, it was good to be found. Amen. Amen. When you confess your sins and you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to clean you up, yes. it was good to be cleaned. Amen. Amen. It's personal. Do you hear? It's very, very personal. God desires us and we should desire God as much as he desires us. We must be careful and we must guard our personal relationship with God, with God Almighty. We need to guard our hearts. We can bring people to church. We can maybe have the anointing to bring them to salvation. But see, we, we have this relationship. They see something in us and that's how we're able to invite somebody, Jim. That's how they, they, they see something different inside of us. So they keep watching, they keep watching and we're able to invite them. Or, or after they watch for so long, they say, what's so different about you? And then you start talking about Jesus. And you got a desire for them. you got a desire that they'll come and have that relationship with Jesus. But they can't live on your desires for them. they got to live on their own desires. We have to live on our own desires. You, Linda, you can't live on the desires that I have for you. i, I got to live on my own desires for that, that I have for God. Trevor and Tori can't live off my desires that I have for them. They're good kids, but they got to have their own desires. they got to build up their own personal relationship with God Almighty. It's got to be personal. Listen, you can't lead a horse to water and make him drink, right? Growing up on the farm, I could, I could lead a sheep, I could lead a goat, I could lead a pony, a horse, and, and, and I, could, I could sit there and they wouldn't drink. I'd get cups of water from the creek and put it in front of their mouth. I could take my hat off, but they wouldn't drink, even though my desire was for them to drink. Our desire so often is we want people to drink from the, from the free living water of Jesus Christ. But they don't want it as bad as you want it. Don't lose your desire to keep, so, to keep drinking from the cup. Amen? Don't lose your desire. We're going to talk about Adam and Eve. They're living in paradise. But what did they do for self-gain? They separated themselves from God Almighty. Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5 and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall, you shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. These two, Adam and Eve, they have such a great personal relationship. God formed Adam from the dust of the ground. Adam has only known God. Eve was formed from his rib. They've only known God. It's so personal and it's so great. And they're, they're in, to me, what, what almost is heaven. They're in a paradise where he was blessed. His relationship with God, he was blessed to be able to name the animals. God said, you have dominion over the fowls of the air, the fish in the seas, over all things. You have dominion. It's personal. They have this very personal relationship. It's a perfect example, though, of why we have to stay on guard. The adversary snuck into a, a perfect paradise. Right. Proverbs 1 and 10 says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If you're facing peer pressure today, don't give in to it. Right. But if you've given in to it, guess what? Jesus has a return, so repent of your sins and come back to the cross and ask him to be the Lord of your life again. Ask him to come back in. They were enticed. Eve was enticed by the serpent. Come eat of this fruit. It'll make you smart. It'll make you wiser. You'll see good and evil. It was personal relationship with God, and God commanded them to stay away from him. Listen, our relationship is personal. Genesis 3 and 6, and when the woman saw that the fruit was good, for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired, to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Adam was enticed because the woman saw the fruit was good. It was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes. It was a tree to be desired, and it would make you wise. Adam and Eve, they had everything. They lived in paradise, but the desire the temptation to be wiser, the temptation to be like God. They desired the one thing that God commanded them to stay away from. Genesis 2, 16 and 17, and the Lord God requested the man. No. The Lord God suggested to the man. No. The Lord God commanded the man, saying of every tree of garden, of the garden that thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge, of good and evil, yeah. 
Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest there, thereof thou shalt surely die. God commanded and God warned them, stay away from it because if you eat of it, you will surely die. They hear the word of truth from God and they say, he says that you will surely die. Don't judge them because I know that we've all eaten of the forbidden fruit once in our life. Maybe twice in our life. Don't judge them because we've been there. But listen, these two, they're so pure and innocent, they don't even know what death is. When you think about it, all they know is life. God made life and it was good. He formed man and it was good. He made woman and it was good. They didn't see death because everything was prospering. It was paradise. It was the Garden of Eden. And when they spoke that you will surely die, I'm not even sure they knew what that meant whenever I was reading this. You will surely die. I don't know that they saw death. I don't know that they fully understood what was going to take place, but it took place. When they ate of the fruit, it separated them from God. They lost themselves. They wanted to save themselves because the fruit was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes. It was to be desired. It would make me wise. They wanted to save themselves by eating of the tree. And the Bible tells me in Romans 6 and 23 that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. <laughs> the wages of sin is death. When we step back into sin, we start getting closer to the kingdom of hell than we do the kingdom of heaven. So we got to protect our relationship. We got to watch what we do. We can't lose the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 1 and 7 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Knowledge. We've got to have fear to have knowledge. If we don't have fear, we're lacking knowledge. And God doesn't want us to lack knowledge. God wants us to be smart. He wants us to be wise. He wants us to have understanding. He wants us to prosper in this world. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. If I save my life, I will lose it. But if I lose it for Jesus' sake, I have life. Adam lost his fear of the Lord and became a fool. Look at your neighbor and tell him, don't be a fool. The woman Eve, she didn't make Adam eat of the fruit. She ate of the fruit. And then she said, here, he had a choice. At that very moment, he could have said, what have you done? God commanded us not to do that. See, God gave us free will in life to make right and wrong decisions. He's always going to. You walk with the Holy Spirit, he's going to convict you when you do wrong. And when you do wrong, God's saying, repent of it. Ask me, confess of your sins, for I will clean you back up. Eve didn't make him eat of the fruit. He gave him a choice. And he took of it and he ate. Google, I said, Google, what's a fool? A fool is a person who acts unwisely. My commentary said a fool is a person that is arrogant and selfish. Yeah. Yeah. Listen to this. One who orders his life as if there were no God. Mm -hmm. Don't be a fool because God is real. God sent his only begotten son to this world not to condemn us but to save us. Don't be a fool because God is alive and well. Psalms 37, verses 23 and 24, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his ways. Who orders the steps of a good man and a good woman? It is the Lord who, who orders our steps, and he delights in them when we follow the right path. Though he fall, even though that we may stumble, he shall not utterly be cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his right hand. You and I, like Adam and Eve, when we're in Christ Jesus, we're born again Christians. We're born again believers. God commands our steps. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't order your own steps. Don't be selfish thinking that you're above God. I'm preaching to myself. Don't think I'm selfish to think I'm above God. Don't go after the forbidden fruit. When we lose ourselves. When we step back into the world that he brought us out of, when we go back to Egypt, we start separating ourselves from God. When we start praying and we're like, God, why aren't you answering my prayers? Well, then we got to start examining what are we doing in our lives? Where are we at? What are we depositing? Adam and Eve ran and hid and God was looking for him. God walked with them. In the cool of the day, God walked with him. God's looking for him and he can't find him. He says, Adam, where are you? He says, God, I'm here. We're naked and we're afraid. And God cares for us. God loves us. God cleansed us. God cleaned us in righteousness. 
God wants you to have everything that you can possibly have. The devil's come to steal, kill, and destroy, but God has come to give you an abundant life. All that you have to do is follow the commands of God. He says, he says I've given you everything. And you have no need to worry about tomorrow. You have no need to worry about the. Listen, he's, he is scared. He says, over here, God, we're naked and afraid. He's worried because they're naked and afraid. God says, don't worry. Don't worry about being closed. I close the birds. I close the lily of the valleys. Don't worry about those things. I will take care of you. But on the flip side of that, let's look at the devil. What did he do? He left them naked and he left them afraid. The devil don't care about you and me. The devil, he'll sweep into our environment and he'll trick us to give up what God is doing for us. He'll trick us into giving up what God wants to do through us because he's enticed us with the forbidden fruit and we take of it and we want to eat. Again, this is personal. This is personal. Huh? We got to guard ourselves. We got to protect who we are so that we can advance the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Adam and Eve had a perfect garden. They were in paradise. And we're very perfect people. Again, I don't know that they ever saw death. And even though God loves us, he gives us that free choice. He gives us free will. The personal choice is to be obedient or disobedient. We can't afford to make the choice thinking that we can do it on our own because we can't. We tried it before we came to salvation. We tried it and we couldn't live on 100%. But some reason we tied 10% and we got an abundance with 90% anymore. I don't understand why, but it comes, it comes, I, you know, I don't know. And you start blessing a little bit more here and there and God starts giving those blessings back so you can keep going blessing and blessing and blessing. It's just how it works in the kingdom. It's how it works. God wants you to just continue. You can't, you can't think that you can do this on your own. You can't think that, that I'm making it to heaven because I'm a good person. You can't think that you're making it to heaven just because I'm always helping people. It doesn't work that way. That's right. Luke 12 and 21 says, so he that layeth up treasure for himself is not rich towards God. Right. Huh? So he that layeth up treasure. So if you're laying up treasures for yourself, you ain't rich in the kingdom of God. You ain't even rich in God. It's saying that you're lost mm -hmm. and you need to be found again. In order to make it to heaven, we've got to be right with God. In order to make it to be, be in heaven, God has to richly be living in us, in our hearts. Luke 9 and 23, Jesus is talking, and he said to them all, saying to all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The gospel and the benefits of the gospel, the blessings of God are based on our personal choices. John 3, 16, whosoever that believes in Jesus has the promise of eternal life. 1 Timothy 2 and 4, God's will is that all will be saved. Who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth? God wants you to come unto the knowledge of truth. He wants to save your soul from damnation. He wants to bring you out. 2 Peter 3 and 9, God is not slack. He hasn't returned yet because he's given all a chance to repent and come to eternal salvation. Yeah. Revelations 22 and 17 says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let them that hear us say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. It's the invitation. It's the invitation to say yes to Jesus yeah. and no to the devil. It's the invitation to confess our sins and let go of the world behind us and just press in for the higher calling on our life. It's the invitation to become the righteousness of Christ. It's the invitation to become the righteousness of God through the crimson blood of Jesus Christ. In that invitation and upon accepting the invitation, we become a new creation, it tells us in 2 Corinthians 5. We're born again, blood blot, spirit-filled believers. Mm. And the only way we're gonna make it in this journey is to follow Jesus and to deny ourselves. We must deny ourselves. We're not following Jesus because it's easy. We're not following Jesus because it's convenient. We're not following Jesus because it's the most popular thing to do, WWJD. We're not following Jesus because we need something. We're following Jesus Christ because he paid the ultimate price. He laid down his life so that we could have life. He gave himself up on a cross, paid our debt in full. That's why we follow Jesus. He took the beating I deserved. He hung on the cross I deserved. But God loved us so much that even while we were in sin, he died for us. Christ died for us. You and I, we weren't even a thought. We weren't conceived, we weren't even born yet, but God did it for us. 
We must follow Jesus no matter the price, no matter the cost. He loves us and he gave himself knowing the price. Think about that. He knew the price. He knew what he had to pay for each and every one of us. He knew what he was going to go through, but he still laid it all down. He said, I got to pay it for you. God loves us. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Take up your cross. When Jesus took up his cross, he knew it was the will of the Father. When he took up his cross, Jesus had, been, had nearly been beaten to death. A crown of thorns placed upon his head. When Jesus took up his cross in all the agony and all the suffering, in the blood that was running down his body, through his tears and through the mockery, Jesus had help carrying the cross. But he carried that cross nearly a half a mile. When Jesus took up his cross, again, you were on his mind. I don't know about you, but if you've ever tried carrying something on your shoulders for a half a mile, it gets heavy and it gets long. And that journey that he made, almost beaten to death, was a journey that none of us could make. But an almighty God who said, I love my children. And today I'm going the distance, Father. Amen. What I'm saying is that Jesus was so in love with us. He was so in love with us that he would not be denied finishing carrying the cross. He was broken and bruised. He still took up his cross for me and you. And at the cross, Jesus exchanged it for salvation. No cross, no conquering hell, death, and the grave. No cross, no resurrection. No resurrection, no celebration. Huh? But he's alive and well. He sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf every single day. No matter what, whenever he sees us start to step in the wrong direction and lose the commandment of God, he starts praying that we would go back towards the right direction, the path of righteousness. Take up your cross, die to sin, and follow him. Romans 6 and 11, likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. When we take up our cross, when we take it up, we're saying to God, I surrender. I surrender everything to you, Lord God. I know that I'm not perfect. I know that I have areas that I struggle with. God, I need you more than I need anything else. God, my day may be long. I don't know what your work days are like. Maybe it's a long day. Maybe it's a long drive. Maybe family life isn't great. Maybe kid life isn't great. I don't know. Maybe the employment isn't great. I don't know. But God, I got areas in my life that I need you to help with. And I surrender. God, please, please help me to live in you. Help me to, help me to be who you call me to be. Help take this area of sin out of my life. Better yet, just take control of it. Welcome the Holy Spirit. In, whenever you take up your cross, welcome the Holy Spirit, the helper and the comforter that God has sent us. Tell him, say, reign over me, Holy Spirit. I'm alive for Christ. I'm not alive for sin. I'm, I'm dead to sin. Help me in everything that I do. Start telling the word, the power of Christ's resurrection is alive in me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Listen, we can die to sin and live for Christ. Colossians 2, 6 and 7. As ye, as ye have thereby received Christ the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. I, I like how it ends with thanksgiving, but I think that we should probably start there. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for life. I thank you that I have blood in my, blood in my system. I thank you that my heart is beating, my lungs are flowing. I thank you that, that I, I, I have a beautiful wife. I thank you for my kids. I, I mean, you just start thinking about everything that's so small that you think is minute and not important. You start thanking God for it, and you realize you could just go 24 hours and just keep it. I, I thank you that I got covers to sleep on. I thank you for the mattress. I thank you for the couch. I thank you for the coffee if you're a coffee drinker. I mean, you start thinking there's so much that you can be thankful for. So walk you in him. How do you walk in him? Why don't we open up the Bible? Everywhere that there's red letters, everywhere that there's red letters, guess what, that's Jesus talking. You wanna walk in him? Read the, read the red. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Uh -huh. 
Huh? Hallelujah. You want to get to know him? You want to walk in him? Open up the red letters and start reading because you're going to start walking in Christ Jesus. You're going to start growing in Christ Jesus because he's speaking to you. He's telling you the truth of how he wants you to act. Lose your life and save it for my kingdom. Huh? Lose your life. We have to continue this progress. It's a progression. We got to study God's word. We got to get into it. We got to want to grow. We got to get into ladies fellowship, men's fellowship. We got to be around like-minded people. We got to grow. We got to get rooted. It says that we got to be rooted and built up. We got to be rooted. When you look at the big red trees, what are they called? Redwood trees out in California. Listen, how, how long do you think their roots grow, Roger? They go six to 12 feet deep. A normal tree is two to six, but to be the one of the biggest trees in the world, six to 12, six to 12. How about your roots in that heart? How much is this rooted in this heart? Where is it at? We gotta root ourselves. We gotta let that start getting inside of our heart, inside of our blood system, inside of our mind, inside of our mouth. We gotta let it just go inside of us. Build up. We've got to be a fortified city. When the devil shoots flaming arrows, that shield of faith has to come out, and we've got to be able to just smack it away and say, not today, devil. I live for the ultimate God, the supreme God, Lord El Shaddai, Jehovah, Yahshua, Yahweh. I live for God. I'm rooted and grounded, and I walk in him. Amen? We've got to be established, a solid foundation. Colossians 1 and 19 says, for it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. So it pleased the Father that in Jesus all the fullness dwelled. What's the fullness? The fullness is the word. The fullness is truth. The fullness is love. Ephesians 3 and 19, we heard it this morning. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. What passes knowledge? Love, the love of Christ. You're going to grow in knowledge with the more red you put inside of you. You're going to grow in knowledge because the love of Christ is in the red letters and it's going to grow your heart. It's going to grow you in knowledge yes. that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul's telling us that God doesn't want to hold anything back from us. God wants to give us the fullness of God. So what do we got to do? We got to start walking in the red letters. We got to start walking in love of Christ. Pass his knowledge. Right. Receive the fullness of God. First Peter 4 and 8, and above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. And I, I know I've used it before. It's different than the society that we live in. Take up your cross and follow me. Pray for your enemy. Pray for those that hate you. Pray for those that persecute you. Uh -huh. You ever done that? Huh? Have you honestly ever done that? Because I, I, I recently have done that. And it changed my heart for that person. Yeah. They're valuable to God. No matter what they said about me, no matter what came out of their mouth, they are valuable to God. And I started seeing that person the way God sees them. Yeah. And it breaks my heart. And I'm praying that their heart gets broken. And God loosens them from the grip of the adversary and they, they come to salvation. Amen? Amen? He tells us, forgive seven times 70. Yeah. You don't just forgive once. You don't just forgive twice. Yeah. It's a long day of forgiveness, but we're going to take up our cross and we're going to follow after him. Amen? 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 We're going to do this. We're going, we're going to learn how to forgive. We're going to learn how to love thy neighbor as yourself, no matter how bad they may be. And maybe you're the bad neighbor. And you've got to learn to start loving your neighbor who's been loving on you for a long time. I don't know. If slap, give the other cheek. Man, that is totally different. It ain't an eye for an eye. It ain't a tooth for a tooth. If you get slapped, boom, you've got to turn the other cheek. Let them have it. After a second time, it doesn't say anything else. <laughs> it doesn't say anything else. That's all I can say. In the red letters, it doesn't say anything else. All right, we gave them twice. That's all I can say. Huh? If someone wants your shirt, you give them a coat. If someone needs help, you go the extra mile. You don't just help them. You go and help finish the project. If someone wants to borrow, you give it without any expectations of it being returned. You want to take up your cross and follow me, Jesus said. Provide for the widows and orphans in their distress. Visit the prisoners. Give food to the needy. Clothe the people. 
love and care for others so that they know that we are his disciples. In closing tonight, you and I have to lose ourselves to save ourselves. You and I, we have to follow him. Philippians 2 verse 12 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Jesus is Paul's shepherd. And Paul is the shepherd to the Philippian church. And Paul is saying, keep walking in your obedience. Whenever I'm around and I'm not around, I'm a proud of how you're handling yourself. I'm proud of you. Keep walking it out. But he says, keep your salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah. Why fear and trembling? Think about fear and trembling. What is one thing in life that you feared and trembled? Remember whenever your child got on their bicycle. You have fear and trembling. Training wheels came off. They're three, five years old, right? You got that fear. You're, hand, you're holding on that handlebar. You got your hand on that seat, and you're walking with them, and you're guiding, and you start taking that hand off, right? And you got fear, and they get, they're, a little sha they're a little shaky, right? But you keep going with them. You put your hand back on there, securing them. You, know, you got fear inside of you because mm -hmm. you're trying to protect your child. You got fear, but you keep going, you let go, and then eventually you let go, and you just want to keep trucking with them, even though they're going faster than you can run. But you got fear because you want to run and catch them. You, run, you want to run and protect them. You got that fear. They go from age three and five to 16. They turn that car, they back out of the driveway. You got fear. You got fear that they're not going to make it home. You got fear that hopefully everything that you've taught them is going to work the right way. You got fear. So protect your salvation with that kind of fear. Guard it with that kind of fear. Verses 15 and 16 in Philippians 2, that you may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Man, we're living it. We're living in this day and time. We got to be blameless and harmless. We got to learn to operate in that love because God won't hold anything back because you'll be operating in the fullness of God with his knowledge. And you'll say the right words because God's going to give it to you. And among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. How do you get the word of life? You walk in him. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Listen, if you're walking, if you're walking with the word of life and you're inviting people and you're leading people to Christ and you're loving on people, you're giving to the needy, then you're not laboring in vain and you're not running in vain. You're running for that higher calling on your life. Shine as lights, he said. Shine as lights, Trey. Shine as lights. See, we come to Christ and we get this fire. See that? That's personal. That's me. And I, I can help lead somebody to church. I can help lead somebody to church. But they can't live off my desire. They can't live off my relationship with God. I can invite more to church. I may even lead somebody to salvation. What's the one thing that keeps going? What's the one thing that keeps going? My fire ain't going out. I can pass the fire. I can pass the flame and the torch to a brother or sister. But it's their personal relationship. Shine as lights. Shine as lights. Amen? Shine as lights. If you will, bow your head, close your eyes. Shine as lights. Shine as lights. Amen. I don't know everybody's heart here tonight, but it's personal. This message is personal. It comes to you from an invitation from God. I don't know where your heart is. I don't know if your fire is still burning the way that it was. Maybe it's dimmed a little bit and you need to come back to the free living water. I know that sounds crazy, but that water will give you a drink and it will refresh that fire. It will refresh that anointing. It will refresh that calling. It'll give you knowledge. It'll give you love for this week, if nothing else. And I encourage you to come to this altar and ask him to fill you back up. 
Is there one here tonight that say, Pastor, I've never confessed the Lord Jesus as my Savior. Is there one? Don't walk out of here lost. Today is a day of salvation. I walked out the door once, lost, and he knocked at my heart again the second time. And I surrendered, and I'm thankful that he knocked at it again. If there's any here tonight that don't know Jesus, I'd ask you to raise that hand. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for your word and your message, Lord God. Father, I pray that we would take this and apply it to our life. That we would shine as lights everywhere that we are. That you would help us, Lord God, reflect you in our lives. Father, I ask your blessing upon us, your anointing upon us. Send us forth, Lord God. Help us as we go. Thank you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the Jewel City Podcast. You can join us in person Sundays at 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. We have something for all people and all ages. Or join our live stream at 10 a.m. 